Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, really good to be here with you um, this morning. It really is a privilege uh, for me to be able to share the Word of God um, with our churches throughout, uh, throughout the district, and uh, it's great for my wife, uh, Stephanie, to be here uh, as well. And uh, every opportunity that I have to visit our churches and to see them and to participate in the service, and then the, the, the even greater privilege to be able to share the Word of God um, is, uh, is just really something that I uh, really value and, uh, and just appreciate. Um, as, uh, as Nathan said, uh, let me just tell you a little bit uh, about, about me. Um, I am the Southeast District uh, Superintendent of the Evangelical Free Church of America, and man, is that a mouthful, right, uh, to be able to say everywhere, uh, everywhere you go. Um, and I assumed this role in uh, January of this year, um, when my, uh, as, as uh, Pastor Nathan said, when my predecessor, Glenn Schreiber, retired at the end of uh, 2022, after uh, more than 20 years of ministry service uh, that he did. Um, and I certainly stand upon his shoulders um, now as I move in uh, into this role. Um, <clears throat> I was pastoring um, a church, an EFCA church in uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania for uh, the past 18 years. And, um, and my wife, uh, Stephanie, and I, we moved to uh, Port Orange, uh, Florida in January of this year, uh, which is in the Daytona Beach um, area. We have uh, three adult uh, children, um, and uh, I'll see if I can get this to, to work. Oh, okay, there we go. That's all right. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is our family doing one of those selfies, and of course, that was the funny face one. And of course, my eyes are closed. Uh, and, and, and for those of, us, uh, those of us who have kids know that they love when their dads make pictures like this because they can make fun of their dad and laugh so our kids do that. Uh, but this is uh, us, and this is kind of the one that is the way it's supposed to be. I'll move it manually. Um, so that's the, that's the picture of our kids, uh, Julia and uh, Gabriella. Gabriella's the one up in front and uh, her husband Ricky, and then Julia and Logan, and then my wife Stephanie, myself, and then our son Mark. Uh, Mark is finishing up his last year at Liberty University uh, in Virginia, and he'll be, move, he'll be living with us in Florida when he makes his way uh, back. And so let me just say that on behalf of the EFCA, um, and also on behalf of the Southeast District, I do want to thank you uh, for your partnership uh, with us in the gospel because you are a part of what we are doing. Uh, we have more than uh, 1,600 uh, churches in the, uh, in the EFCA, 100 plus churches in the Southeast District, and it makes up those nine states uh, that you see here. So it's a pretty, pretty large uh, district uh, represented um, in the Southeast, and you should just know that Christ Community Church right here in Ocala, you're a part of what we are, are doing nationally and in the district. And that's an important message for me to bring every time I come into one of our churches, for you to understand that you are part, yes, you're doing great work here, and we want to continue to pray for that, but you're a part of something even larger, something going on even greater throughout the district and also the world. Um, thank you again, Pastor Nathan, for inviting me to come and to uh, share uh, the Word of God with you this morning. Uh, the EFCA mission is to glorify God by multiplying transformational churches among all peoples. And the heart of the EFCA is to multiply healthy churches, but to do so among all people, all peoples. And that's really the topic of the passage that, that I'd like to uh, share with you today. I'm going to be in uh, Acts chapter 10, and in today's text, what you're going to see is uh, that Peter, the apostle, he comes to realize that this gospel message that he's always known uh, as from the time he was introduced to it by Jesus, he's known it as a Jewish gospel. And, and, and now what's happening here is there's a, there's a transition happening where the gospel is being very, very clearly brought to all nations. And so even up until this time, he may have thought still that this was really primarily 
for the Jews, for his people. But now it's clear, as, as, to, as you're going to see here what happens, that God had other plans. Really, God had other plans uh, the entire time. The entire time that he was in uh, ministry, God had other plans in mind. And so I'm going to pray and ask God to lead us, and, uh, and then we're going to look into his, his word. So would you pray with me? Lord, we recognize that even now as we gather in your name, what a beautiful thing it is for the people of God to gather in your name on your Lord's day. And this is happening not just here, but across the nation and across the world. And we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we pray that you would work and you would minister and Holy Spirit of God, that you would illuminate your truth and that we would have ears to hear and hearts to understand as only you can do. And we ask you to do that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So first, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with a, an introduction to Cornelius because that's how um, Acts chapter 10 starts. And I'm going to kind of briefly go over uh, Acts 10, summarize some of it, and then I want to focus in on a couple passages but in verse 1, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what is known as the Italian cohort. And so Luke, he starts chapter 10. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And he starts chapter 10 by taking us to Caesarea. Now chapter 9, if you went back a chapter, that ended with Peter, and the, the, talking about the apostle Peter, and he was in Joppa. And that's how chapter 9 ends. But now Luke starts 10 in Caesarea, which is on the coast, and it's about 30 miles north of Joppa, 30 miles north of where Peter is. Caesarea is the capital, and we need to understand a little bit about it to really appreciate what's going on here, because Caesarea is the capital of the Roman province of Judea. It was a military town. It was a, there was a very large Roman garrison of, of soldiers that were stationed there. And so Cornelius is introduced to us by Luke, as a centurion, a Roman soldier of rank, an officer. Now, a Roman legion of soldiers consisted of 6,000 men, and they were divided into groups of 600 each. And a centurion commanded, uh, as you would think, 100 of these men. And so each legion had 60 of these centurions, and, and these centurions were known really to be the backbone of the Roman army. And, and so Luke tells us that Cornelius is a centurion in the Italian cohort, and he would have been paid probably about five times more than the, a rank and file soldier. So he's a respected man. Now, another important background to all of this is something that all of Luke's audience would have known. And it's very important as we, as we interpret Scripture, and a good hermeneutic for us every time we, we look at Scripture and we read it, is to understand the audience of the writer, the author, and how they would have understood it, and not to deviate our meaning from that. And, that, and, that, and that's really, if you really think about the, the, Luke's audience, they would have understood that the Romans occupying Palestine and Israel was not something that the people of Israel liked. They didn't appreciate it. They were against it. They, in fact, hated the Roman army that enforced this occupation of their land that God had given to them. So Cornelius would not have necessarily been a welcomed guest to the Jews. That's, that's part of what we need to understand. Now, the next thing that Luke does is he tells us about the religious devotion of Cornelius. And, and we see that in verse 2. A devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. And so what Luke is doing here now is he is, he is describing the religious devotion of Cornelius. Cornelius was a devoted man, is what, it's, is what the text says. A man who feared God. Very interestingly that he's described that way. He gave generously and he prayed continually. Now think about that description. Not, some of us wouldn't mind having that description of us, right? And this is, a, this is a Roman Gentile. He's described as a devout man, meaning that he had sincerity and devotion to the God of Israel. Again, quite unique for a Roman soldier. He was listed as a man who feared God, or what we would call a God-fearer. And that term, God-fearer, was applied to Gentiles who had displayed faith in Judaism, or the God of Israel. 
Now, typically, these God-fearing Gentiles were not circumcised. They, they wouldn't go that far, and nor would they necessarily follow the strict kosher dietary restrictions, but they would still believe in this God of Israel, and sometimes in addition to their other gods. And Luke tells us that all of his household, in verse 2, feared God, meaning that his family and his servants. And then also Luke says that he gave alms generously to people. So he was giving to the poor, giving to the needy, probably more specifically the Jewish poor and needy. And then Luke tells us that he prayed continually to God. And this indicates that he probably went to the Jewish synagogue to pray and worship as part of him being a God-fearer. So it's clear, even as already been mentioned, that Cornelius was seeking God. Yet if he had gone to the Jerusalem temple, he would not have been allowed past the Gentile court. But yet here he is, worshiping or seemingly worshiping the God of Israel, but he's still a Gentile. He's still an outsider. He's a Roman soldier on top of it. And most importantly, he has not yet believed the gospel. The gospel hasn't, and that's what we're going to see transpire here. And so the next thing that, uh, that Luke tells us about is this vision of Cornelius. The vision of Cornelius. And you see that in verses 3 through 8. And in this vision, an angel tells him to send men to Joppa to find Peter and to bring Peter back to Caesarea. Now notice how interesting that is because God doesn't tell him to go. God says, send someone and bring him back. So Cornelius does what, what, what he's told. He sends two of his servants and a trusted soldier to Joppa to do exactly uh, as he was told in the vision. And if you think about it, Cornelius is a military guy. He obeys orders, right? He's used to that. People obey his orders, so he immediately obeys. And then Luke tells us next about Peter's vision, and we see that in verses 9 through 16. Luke describes a vision that Peter has. And in this vision, God declares meat that had been previously unclean to now be clean. Very interesting. This is a monumental revelation from God because thousands of years of tradition is now going to change. It's going to be undone by this revelation. It's significant because what it's doing and what Luke is doing is he's signifying that things are changing. And they're going to change big time. So if we, if we kind of boil down the, the meaning of this vision, because this, this vision, if you look at it in, in, in Acts 10, it can be hard to understand. But I, I would like to say it this way, that the purifying of the unclean animals in the vision, is, it's symbolizing that God is going to be purifying the unclean Gentiles. This is going to happen through the gospel. And, and, and so, in the vision, the unclean animals were declared to be clean, and it signified that soon, unclean Gentiles would be declared clean through the gospel, something that Peter would need to know and understand as a mouthpiece of the gospel. He needs to understand this and know this. So the story continues. And as the story continues, these men from Caesarea arrive in Joppa, verses 19 through 20. And they arrive at the house where Peter is staying. And at that same moment that they arrive, as Luke writes this and tells us about it, the Spirit tells Peter to go with the men who are here from Caesarea and he's, that he's to go without hesitation. And so the next morning, they, 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 they're hospitable. They host these men. And then the next day, they leave for Caesarea. Now, if you stop in the story right here, which in the Bible, it's always a good idea to do this, to to kind of step back and say, okay, what's going on? You see this story unfolding. Everyone is doing what they're told, but no one knows exactly why yet. There is this sense of God is doing something that they're not necessarily completely aware of, but their role is not to know necessarily what God is doing, but to faithfully obey. We can learn that lesson too, right? Right? To trust God. He doesn't tell us everything, but he can, he, he's asking us to be faithful and to trust him. All right, so then we have, Luke takes us to the arrival then in uh, Caesarea, in 24 through 33. And what happens when Peter arrives in Caesarea? Cornelius has invited all of his friends, his close friends and his relatives, 
and, and, and he's invited them over to his house to hear what this man Peter had to say. Think about that. Now, who are his friends? Well, he, we just learned a little bit about him. He's in the Roman army. He's a centurion. He has a hundred guys that report to him, and he's probably good friends with other centurions who have a hundred guys reporting to them. So I'm thinking that this group of friends and relatives probably consists of a, of a large Gentile crowd made up of probably a good deal of Roman soldiers. And this is the audience Peter has. And what happens is Cornelius tells Peter, hey, let me tell you what the vision I had. And then Peter says, let me tell you the vision I had. And they kind of share these vision stories, right? And they both realize something. God has orchestrated this. God has brought them together. But why? And that's really what, where I want to focus the, most, uh, the, the rest of our time because here then Peter speaks to the Gentiles. Because all that's happened so far is leading to this. In verse 33, he's speaking to the Gentiles. And it says, so I sent for you at once, and you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Now, th these are great words for any pastor to hear. Imagine you hear that, right? Or, or you, you go, to a, you go to a family gathering, and they say that to you when you walk in. Look, and I got all these people together, and we're all here. Tell us what God has told you to say. And you're like, whoa, whoa, right? But this is, this is what's happening for Peter. He's been brought into the situation. It was only two days before that he had this vision where everything was changing. And now he has to step into this. And he has to faithfully obey. What a setup for a sermon. We're all here. Tell us what God commanded you to say. And he's like, I'm hoping he really comes out and lets me know what that is as it's coming out, right? As I'm, as I'm trusting him. So picking up in verse 34, look what Luke tells us. The first thing, it's so interesting the way Luke writes this, Peter opened his mouth. Because it's almost one of those moments where it's like, you're, you've been brought into this hostile situation, and the guy says, tell us what God said, and you go, right? Like, whoa, Peter opened his mouth in faith. Now, it's true that our mouths can get us all into a lot of trouble. And for many of us, we could probably do a whole lot more listening than talking. But when it comes to gospel witness, we need to open our mouths. We just do. And most times it's just because we're, we're simply afraid. But Luke makes it clear here. Peter opened his mouth. He began to speak. What does he say? What does the Spirit of God say through him? Now, what you need to understand before we even look at it is what's also going on with Peter, okay? Okay. Because Peter is about to share what God has very recently revealed to him. This isn't something he's been learning his whole life and getting trained and now he's ready to say it. This is something that just a couple of days ago, he had this vision, he's on this trip and he's wondering what is going on and now he's got to declare it. So it's almost like he's declaring what God is doing in him while declaring truth about it. Verse 34 what does he share? God shows no partiality along ethnic lines. Verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Now what, why, is he, why is he saying that? Well, we need to understand the context. Peter is specific, uh, specifically talking about the fact that he now realizes that when it comes to salvation and the gospel, God shows no partiality among people. Somehow, this gospel that started with the Jews is now for all people, including the Gentiles. Why? Because God is not partial. So the gospel is for the Romans, the gospel is for the Greeks and the Jews, and this may not be for us that big of a deal because we're looking back, but it was life-changing to Peter. And it's not like Peter hadn't seen the gospel go to Gentiles before, but this marked very, very specifically in Scripture, uh, a change, a, a, a shift of what was going to happen. This whole meeting, 
was supernaturally orchestrated by God on purpose. Why? Because God was making it clear that he did this and that it is God's idea to bring the gospel to all people, not man's idea. Again, God is not partial. Peter understood this. And this is why evangelicals today, this is why today we, we, we have to understand this and we have to reject ideologies that rationalize partiality against certain groups of people. Why? Because God is not partial. That's what he's saying. God is not partial. But he goes on from there, and it's more than that. He says that God welcomes all people from every nation, verse 35, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter is making it clear that all nations, every nation is welcome to worship God just as Peter does. So the litmus test is no longer Jewish ethnicity that has changed. It's not about any more so-called unclean food or dietary restrictions based on the vision that Peter just had in Joppa. None of that now is the determining factor of salvation. It's not based on what nation you were born in. It's not based on the color of your skin. It's based on this free gospel, faith in Jesus. Our culture today is making everything about ethnicity. But God is saying ethnicity is not the basis for salvation. Salvation is for every nation. God welcomes all people. Every nation is invited. But but listen to what also he says in in that verse. Anyone who fears him, right, and does what is right. So all nations must fear him, live in reverence of God. They must do what is right and pleasing to God, and that, must, that can only happen in and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Third, Jesus, who is Israel's promised Messiah, is also Lord of all the nations. We see that in verse 36. Look at verse 36. That's for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That's how Luke writes this. And I love the point that Luke is making here because he's saying not only is God not partial, not only does God welcome every nation, but he is, Jesus, the Lord of the nations. Think about that. So God doesn't invite the other nations to worship him because God is just a really good option. That's not why. He doesn't invite the other nations to worship him because society today has made it it clear that we need to be more inclusive and accepting. And so so this is what God's going to do. No, that's that's not correct. What this text is telling us is that he welcomes all nations because he is the Lord of them. He is the Lord of the nations. That means there's not a single nation in existence that our God is not the Lord over that nation. He is the Lord of the nations. And when Christ, who is Lord of the nations, sends his witnesses to those nations, it's not colonization, it's not colonialism, it's gospel proclamation in obedience to the call. Why should every nation worship Jesus? Because he is is Lord of all, of all nations. And that's what this text is making clear. And then from here, what Peter does is he begins to proclaim the gospel. Now, if you notice, he hasn't done that yet. He hasn't proclaimed the gospel to this Gentile crowd. And, and, and don't, again, lose sight of the context of this, of this house and group of people and what he's about to say, dominated probably by the Roman army. And as we go through this, I want you to just notice how clear Peter is of what the gospel is. Let this be a reminder to all of us who are involved in gospel proclamation is, needs to be clear, even in the midst of this kind of environment. It's not confusing. confusing. It's very clear. What is Peter's declaration of the gospel? First, he talks about Christ crucified, verse 39. This is such a good example to us. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Where does Peter start? At the cross. Not only that, he assumes who is guilty. They put him to death. Now, if you answer that question, who? Well, the Jewish and the Roman leaders in Jerusalem put him to death. Peter, do you know your audience? Whoa. Do you remember? 
Peter, look around. I'm sure visually he had reminders all around him of soldiers probably with swords. You, they, put him to death. He takes him to the cross. Gospel presentation, very clear. It's a cross-centered presentation. And Peter is saying to all these Gentiles, if you plan to commit your life to this Jesus, you will need to come to the cross too. It doesn't matter your nation of origin. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on, and not just Christ crucified, but Christ resurrected. But God raised him on the third day in verse 40. And Peter makes it clear, yes, Jesus died, but he was raised to life again, and God did it. It was God's power that raised him. They may have killed Jesus, but he did not stay dead in the tomb. No, he is risen. And since this Jesus defeated death and sin, we too can defeat death and sin because he lives, we can live too. And he goes on. Christ resurrected. Then he says, Christ revealed. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. The ESV translates that, made him to appear. The NIV says, caused him to be seen. Which means it's not enough for the Lord Jesus just to be raised to life. He needed to be seen. He needed to be touched and heard. Just like 1 John 1 starts. Right? We've seen and touched and heard. God made him appear, caused him, the risen Christ, to be seen. Peter says in verse 41, not to all, but to us. What did he mean by that? Well, he means the apostles. He's like, those of us who were, who were commanded to take this gospel to all people, God made sure we saw the risen Christ. Again, the Christian gospel is a well-documented story. There are witnesses to these things, plenty of them. Peter goes on. Christ proclaimed, and he commanded us. Look what he says in verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify who is the he there. He's referring back to Jesus. Peter makes it clear, I'm only doing what I've been commanded by Christ to do, and that is to preach the gospel and, to the people and to testify. And what am I testifying to? What is he on trial? Is, this, is he like in a courtroom as a witness? Yes, he's an eyewitness that he has seen this Jesus. He saw him die, saw him dead, saw him alive, and he is God in the flesh. You know, I hear a lot talking today in the, whether it's in the church or, or, or in society just we make light of preaching don't preach it then we need to do a whole lot more than preaching but let's not also forget that the command to preach to the people and to testify came from christ himself this is what peter's doing in fact the way that peter writes this or says this and that luke records it is that preaching the gospel is how the nations are reached and that is precisely what Peter said in verse 42 and what he's doing. But he goes on and says Christ forgives and saves. Look at verse 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives what? Forgiveness of sins through his name. So what do the prophets and the apostles, what are they bearing witness to? Only Jesus forgives sin. Only Jesus saves. He is the one. In fact, Peter says Everyone who believes in him, truly believes, receives this forgiveness. Everyone. Again, all nations. Everyone who believes in faith. This isn't universal salvation. This is saving faith. Saving faith. And what a message this must have been for the Gentiles to hear. Think about them listening to this. Maybe for the first time in their life, they are hearing they can be forgiven. Peter's telling them how. Through this, Jesus, you can be forgiven and saved. And then from here, Luke tells us in verse 44 what happened. How did these Gentiles respond to the gospel? Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. 
And as, as Peter is preaching this incredible sermon, the Holy Spirit moves and he falls on all who heard the word, on those who had ears to hear. It's the, the way that Luke writes this is very similar to how he wrote in Acts 2 in Jerusalem, which was what? Pentecost. This seems, he's writing this in very similar language as a Gentile Pentecost. The text tells us that the Spirit fell on those who heard the word. Only those who heard the word. Why? Because they had ears to hear. They believed, the text tells us, and they were baptized. Why? Because not only does the gospel go to the nations, but the gospel saves the nations. And I believe that this is where Cornelius believed the gospel and was saved. And that's how, that's how it seems that Luke presents this. Peter declaring the gospel in Caesarea is the gospel going. The spirit falling on those who heard the word is the gospel saving. What an amazing story. Incredible story that God has preserved for us today. Now I want to give you a, a foundational truth about this gospel going to all the nations. A, a foundational truth that you can build on. And that is this, that the gospel going to every nation is not an accident, it's not a coincidence, it's not man's idea. It is and always has been the preordained divine plan of God to reach the nations. We need to understand that. It's not an accident that the gospel is all over the globe. That's been God's intent from the beginning. But the story that we studied today is how God, is how God is revealing to us that he, that he did this. It's the beginning of that happening, of how he's going to work. Acts 10 happened quite supernaturally. I mean, think about how Acts 10 happened. A Gentile Roman centurion in Caesarea hears from God. An apostle staying in Joppa 30 miles away also hears from God. Both from God, both with the same purpose. What? To bring these two together. But it's not just so that Cornelius gets saved. That's not what this story is about. Cornelius gets saved in the story. But that's different than what the story is about. Right? The story is making clear that God is now bringing the gospel very intentionally to all nations and no one is to keep that from happening, especially those called by his name. And it's part of the reason that this church here in Ocala exists. For the gospel to be proclaimed to all people. Because it continues today. That's what's so amazing about this book. What's so amazing about it is that things happen and started here like in Acts chapter 10, right? Through, through this uh, intentional and supernatural power and work of God, but it continues today through us. Isn't that amazing? We get to be a part of what it is that God is doing, that God started. And God is still very much interested in reaching the nations, all peoples. That, and, and, and you need to know that's at the heart and the mission of the EFCA. It's at our heart to be very intentional about this. And that is why it's such a beautiful thing for your church body to be doing what you're doing, to even celebrate what you're celebrating today, to have this time of prayer over... Uh, Krista, I think it was, right? And, 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 and recognizing that that's part of how you're helping the gospel to go to all nations. And also for the fact that you were a part of starting the very first EFCA Brazilian church plant. Amen. Very first one. You, this church right here, we're a, we're a part of that. Because you're continuing what God started here in Acts 10. The gospel to the nations. And why do we do this? Because Jesus is the Lord of the nations. And it is his plan for this gospel to go forth into every nation. So my encouragement to you is to continue to make this gospel known. Let them know about Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ revealed, Christ proclaimed, and Christ only forgives and saves. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege that you've given to us to be bearers and witnesses of this gospel. Continue to help each of us to take that on with, with joy and privilege to make this known and bless this church, Lord. 
Bless this body as they seek to do just that in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.